We're going to talk about love in the collection today, the highs and the lows, the goods and the bad. So um, I wanted to start with this image of love. And if you haven't been on one of these programs before, I welcome and encourage your participation. You can either share comments via the chat or you can just unmute and jump right in. This is really a conversation um, as we explore these different works of art together. So that being said, I'll give you a moment to take this image in. I know some of you are familiar with this one. Um, and just what is going on in this image? Well, it looks like the angels surrounding Mary and the baby, but being pulled on a cart by, I think, a lion. <laughs> yeah, so there's a lot going on would be my, my answer. And you, yeah, you've nailed it. So we've got these sort of angel figures, these little puti um, who are flying around, a, a figure you've identified as someone who reminds you of Mary uh, holding additional babies. And then they're standing on some sort of cart that seems as though it is being pulled by a lion. Yeah, that's a that's a great a great summary of the overall composition. What else is going on here? It appears that all of this is going on on some type of a stage that's framed with pillars on either side, and then we see uh, ties on the pillar that are holding back the fabric that's draping um, along the top. So it's almost like a theater whose curtains have been opened. Okay, so Ingrid, you're zooming out a little bit and asking us to think about the sort of the setting and it almost to you looks like a stage and it's a little bit hard to see here. And actually the original painting has been cropped at the bottom. Um, so it's kind of cut off, but there's it seems like there's sort of a stage and then it's framed by these two columns or pillars. And then you've noticed that it almost seems as though there's some sort of curtain or tapestry that is being furled around either column um, and tied to the columns there. So giving us this sense of theatricality or a stage set. Excellent. What, what else is going on in this image? I don't know what's going on, but um, the very strange things being uh, that seem to be tied to the pillar, I can't quite figure out what they are. One looks as if it might be a helmet, and the one to the right, I don't know what that is. And where are you looking up at the at the top, Jackie? Or? No, you see there's a little rope you right there. Yeah. Oh, right here, right here. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, and I can zoom in on that for you too. It's It almost seems as though it's this sort of fabric that's been wrapped around, but I see how it makes this sort of cavernous head-shaped thing that looks like a helmet, yeah. And then on the other side, there's that same sort of, um, that same sort of occurrence. Sure. Um, and I think, John, were you gonna add something? I was gonna add that one of the figures down at the bottom there is using a firebrand to apparently chase away the snakes. Yeah, yeah, and I'm, I'm, I'm loving this Zoom feature. I'm gonna take good advantage of it today. Uh, yeah, so this little figure here has this sort of flaming torch. It seems to be sort of prodding or um, shooing away these entwined snakes that are um, at his feet there. Yeah, so let's, there's a lot of this sort of um, intentional symbolism here uh, in this painting. So is there anything that strikes you? John has drawn our attention to the snakes and the fire. Um, we've sort of explored the set and these, these odd shapes um, on either side. Are there any other symbols that sort of feel familiar to you or you think might have some meaning? I was just going well, to- Well, the apple and the snakes make me think of, uh, you know, the uh, a biblical reference. Mm -hmm. um, and Absolutely. I, I, Is this the apple here that you're referring to, Jackie? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is that an apple or a flaming heart? I could never okay. tell. It's yeah. a little hard to tell. Yeah. yeah. Um, often when we talk about this with it, with the public in front of the painting, everyone thinks it's a, an apple. It may be a flaming heart because of the, you know, the flames coming out the back there, which are a little bit hard to see in this reproduction, but it does have that round shape of an apple. And so, you know, potentially it could be a, a, a double illusion there. But you're thinking, Jackie, you're thinking um, sort of a, of a Bible story. It's reminding you of, of Christian um, stories. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, Adam and Eve in the garden kind of thing, the snake and the apples is what it was, um, what was my analogy? Sure, yeah, the Adam and Eve and the and Eden and the apple and the snakes, absolutely. 
What um, else? What else can we find? They represented evil, and he um, he cajoled Eve into sin. So you have both sin and evil represented with the snakes. Yeah, so Ingrid, you're building on Jackie's comment and, and reminding us that snakes in this setting and probably in this painting as well um, remind, are, are evil and temptation and sin. And so the fact that, um, as has been pointed out, that this little little cute chubby kid is driving away the snakes is probably a good thing, getting rid of the, the evil and the sin in this, in this painting. The lion has an expression on his face that is not typical of what you might expect <laughs> to see from a lion. It's almost like I have a secret or I'm, I'm, I'm one of the meekest animals. It, it just doesn't fit our concept of a lion. Yes, Mary. So you are drawing our attention to this, this lion here with just, I don't know what to make of his expression exactly. It, it's a little bit hard to articulate, but very different than what we would expect to see from a wild beast, the king of the jungle, a lion. Um, and, and so you, you've drawn our attention to this sort of incongruency between this expression here, which seems very human-like in a lot of ways, and what, what, what we know about, about lions in the wild. So I'm curious to the group, what do you make of that? Why do you think this lion has been featured so prominently kind of looking right out at us? Hmm. Hmm. He Maybe it's a warning. <laughs> Karen, you're saying it, he might, it might be a warning? Yeah. And the other lion is facing straight ahead. So. Yeah. He might want to be drawing our attention to the fact that he's acting as a, a carrier for the little pootie who's sitting on top of him with an arrow like a cupid. So maybe that's how the lion got tamed with that arrow. Okay, so yeah, so Karen's saying maybe it's a it's sort of a warning. And I think often when we see people looking directly out at us at a painting, it's meant to be sort of a warning to us. And then Ingrid is, is speculating that because there's this sort of Cupid-like figure with an arrow, um, maybe the lion has been tamed by by the, the, the arrow of Cupid or, or of love potentially, um, and is sort of now become this sort of human-like tamed beast. And I think I think both are, are absolutely right. Um, you see the line here. I think that the symbolism is, symbolism is meant to evoke this idea that, um, you know, he, he has been tamed by love and now he is this sort of docile creature who's plodding along, pulling this, what seems to be a heavy cart made of gold with several people standing on it. Um, so absolutely. And, and just like the, the snakes sort of symbolize, you know, they're, they're shooing away evil here. Wildness has been tamed. Um, so all kinds of messages going on here. Are there other... Are there other things that strike your, your fancy in this the painting that seem significant to its meaning? Or things that you have questions about? The pooty that are circling the mother and her children uh, almost seem to be forming kind of a halo over them. Okay, yeah, so noticing the, the, how these, the composition, how these uh, little puti or little child cherubs are arranged almost seem like a halo. So bringing us back to this earlier idea that there's some sort of Christian symb symbolism as well. Um, and, and a halo we know represents sort of holiness. And I wanna go back to this earlier comment. Um, someone had identified this figure here as Mary. Um, what did you see that made you say it looked like Mary? I think it was mostly the, the clothing and the closeness of the one baby, mm -hmm. but uh, yeah, that, that's a very, uh, what, 1700 um, style clothing. So, or maybe 1800, I'm no, not really sure about that. <laughs> No, you're absolutely right. And I think uh, this is actually meant to be the, the figure of, of charity, the representation of charity. But Rubens, the artist, very deliberately uh, depicted the figure of charity sort of in the guise of the Virgin Mary as well, dressed as we often see her dressed with this closeness we associate between mother and child. Usually when it's the Virgin Mary, she's holding the Christ child. 
here, this poor woman has two other babies to contend with too. She's got her hands full. Um, <laughs> but but definitely what we see in this image, and I think this is what you've all been, been hitting on in your comments, is this sort of marrying of these two worlds of sort of um, the sort of allusions to classical past and antiquity, um, and then the Christian present, um, and then all under this guise of, of the representation of charity, um, which is this, this figure here. And I'll show you. Um, and and what year was this painted? Yes, it was the 17th century. You were absolutely Thank right, you. about 1625. Um, and, and the name of this particular painting, it's one in a series, is The Triumph of Divine Love. So, so here, um, charity is sort of an emblem of divine love, right? She has sort of enough milk to feed all of her many children. And she represents the sort of, you know, expansive, infinite love of God to man, but also the more secular, profane love of, of man to fellow man. So there's just kind of love overload in this picture, which is why I thought we would start out with it. <laughs> um, and I think we had a couple comments in the chat. Let's see. Oh, uh, Faith is saying the cherubs on the right look full of mischief. Yeah, I totally agree. I think they're they're definitely not docile little babies, right? So you see that this woman has her hands full, but she seems like she's kind of in control as well. Um, oh, go ahead, Ingrid. I was just going to point out, if you're ever in uh, gallery one, standing in front of this painting, make sure to walk back and forth uh, across, across the room and keep your eyes on the eyes of the lion because Peter Paul Rubens has created a real trick of the eye here. As you look at the eyes of the lion and you walk through that gallery, the eyes of the lion will follow you wherever you go. Yeah, it's fun to, to be able to do that in person and it's a little hard to, to replicate that on a virtual program, unfortunately. Um, but, and I, and I encourage you to, when, I don't know if you noticed the dimensions, but this is a very, very large uh, painting, uh, larger than life, probably what, like 10 feet tall. I can't do the math converting inches to feet. But um, <laughs> when, you, when you're standing in front of it, you really get a sense of all of the different details. And I wanna just point out some of them here, again, because they all kind of go back to the central idea of, of divine love or charity. Um, and one thing you see here, it's a little bit hard to make out, but this is a pelican. Uh, or what Ruben thought a pelican would look like, uh, pulling flesh from its own breast. So this idea of sacrifice, and that, it was thought that pelicans would do that to feed their young. So this idea of, of flesh and sacrifice um, in the service of love and, and you know, protecting your children. Um, and then I wanted to point your attention too, to these, these sort of dove figures that have been a little bit cropped, like I mentioned at the beginning. Um, but doves were associated with the Holy Spirit in the Christian tradition, but also with Venus, the goddess, the ancient goddess of love. So again, you see Rubens, the artist, really deliberately bringing together sort of, you know, symbols from antiquity, classical symbols of love with Christian iconography, um, all in the service of sort of the new world order um, where divine love is, reigns supreme. Um, and you can even see there are some little arrows, like Cupid's arrows on the spokes of the wheels. You know, Ingrid had mentioned this little arrow here we think of as Cupid. Um, and just overall, it feels like this, it does feel like a triumph to me, but I'm curious, you know, uh, what your overall take on something like this is. Is this, does it feel like too much? Is it over the top? Does it feel, you know, fortifying and affirmative to you? What do you make of, uh, of this kind of painting? I was in the gallery looking at that painting once. Two women walked in from the vestibule who'd obviously never been in the museum before. One of the women started crying and talked about how uh, beautiful the painting was. So um, I think if the painting can evoke that kind of reaction from somebody, that pretty much says it all. Wow, that's incredible. Yeah, I, I have never seen someone have a that visceral of a reaction to any painting in our collection, but I, I would like to. Um, so yeah, so my, my last kind of question for this is, you know, all this kind of symbolism and kind of complex religious iconography aside, for us in, in 2021 in Sarasota, what does this painting have to tell us about the nature of love? Is there any sort of lesson we can take from this uh, into our modern day lives? Or what does it say to you specifically? Maybe all encompassing love. Hmm. All encompassing. I like that. 
And when you look at the chariot, you can see why um, John Ringling might have been attracted to this particular painting because it looks a little bit like a circus wagon when you look at the wheels. And okay, I like that. So also connecting to, to your love of profession or what you've you've made your staked your claim as as a professional and for him it was the circus it's all encompassing yeah I think for me it's that quote you know love is patient love is kind I think for me I, as a mom of a toddler I'm like oh this woman is so patient and that, that's how she's kind of showing her love she's got all this swirling around her but she's giving attention and care to everyone who needs her and I think that's something to aspire to and Anita you've got your hand up what about you to me, it seems very maternal, the, the, whole, the whole thing. You know, if you look at it as a, an entire representation, it looks very maternal. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, this, and I think you're so right, Anita, that maternal is a great word to describe it. And again, um, that sort of like that first love between mother and child um, as being so, so important and profound, um, and then how that can be extrapolated out to other um, relationships and, and forms of love. All right. Also love perhaps contains some of our baser instincts with the lion. Oh, Mary, I like that. Yeah. So love can tame our baser instincts. Yeah. So love can, love can conquer all, or at least some of our wild side, um, mm -hmm. and, and become, create a lion who looks sort of friendly and human, like, like he wants to have a conversation with you. <laughs> I love that. Oh, I love that. That's a good choice of words. All right. Any other comments or questions about this one before we move on to our next work? Okay. So I wanted this was this was sort of the the mother, you know, maternal love, all encompassing love. But now I want to get a little more specific and look at uh, zoom in on an image of of two lovers here. So as you look at this image, I want you to sort of ascertain what is the dynamic between the two of them, in your opinion, and what do you see that makes you say that? And you can feel free to unmute or, or share in the chat, whatever you're more comfortable with. I guess my first question would be, do you, do you buy into the premise that these are lovers? And if so, what is the dynamic between the two of them, the dynamic of their- I'm kind of struggling a little. I'm, I'm kind of struggling a little bit with the hands. Mm -hmm. the, the upper part, the hands are entwined. Uh huh. But her other hand seems to be questioning. I don't. It, it, they uh -huh. they kind of don't seem to fit exactly for me. Okay, so you're drawing our attention to the the importance of gesture here, and you're looking at. There's these clasped hands here where they seem to be holding hands, which you know, okay. But then you're noticing her hand here that's in the shadow. Is if you described it as a questioning gesture, which I think is a good way of describing it. When I, I make this, I'm kind of I feel that when I when I make that gesture myself. Um, and I can zoom in a little bit just to sort of show you. So you've got the, the entwined hands here and then down in the shadow, this other hand. So what what do you all think? Do you agree with Mary's assessment that this is sort of a, a questioning gesture or is, are you reading it differently? Yeah, I like that. I never thought of um, I never thought of that hand in that way before. But maybe she's uh, they're having a conversation and she might be saying something like, hey, listen, we've been together for two years. Where's the ring? <laughs> <laughs> So yes, very. We can note, especially in you know the modern context, there's no uh, engagement ring on that finger. It's a bare hand that she's extending in a questioning way. So, so Ingrid, you're you're perhaps sussing out a little bit of uh, perhaps a little bit of a confrontation between the two, or or sort of a, a demand being made. Well, I think it's a friendly confrontation. If anything, she's got certainly a nice smile on her face, and she's uh, looking very adoringly at her man. Okay, so you're also so while while perhaps there's a friendly kind of confrontation going, you you see her as sort of adoring this this figure, um, and and faith is added. In, no, you don't. And tell us why. Well, he looks almost surprised by her advances, um, and she's in a, a flimsy outfit. <laughs> he might even be removing her hand. <laughs> ah, okay, so. 
So instead of this being sort of two lovers clasping hands, you know, gently, uh, he might be taking her hand off of his shoulder and saying, kind of step off. Um, I wanted to share faith in the chat said, I think she has her hand out looking for a payment of some kind. They might be lovers, but not in love. Ooh. So that's a whole other, that's a whole other, could be a whole other side <laughs> of the story. Yeah. Um, and, and Josh, you've got your hand up. What do, what's your take on this? I think some people are reading way more into this than there is. I think these are two people who only have eyes for each other. Her left hand is just making a gesture of, to emphasize something she's saying. It could be, I only have eyes for you, or I, I'm so in love with you. There, there's nothing uh, underhanded or, or, you know, there's no, I don't think there's a backstory here. I think these two people are just totally in love. So Josh is the romantic of the group, duly noted, and he is seeing this as a, a pure representation of, of love and seeing nothing nefarious about it, no sort of, uh, no sort of underlying narrative that's going to undermine this relationship. Uh, just pure, pure two people in love. <laughs> All right, Anita, what's your take? Do you agree with Josh or are you skeptical about this relationship? Well, I can you hear me? We can hear you, yep. I think uh, she seems to be saying, well, if you love me, why did you do that? <laughs> mm. and, and, the, and the fact that she's very light and very pure looking kind of, and they his face is in a shadow and sort of sinister, like he's explaining himself away. That's kind of how it looks to me. <laughs> Okay, so so you're, you've are you also introduced a new element to our interpretation, which is this contrast between light and dark. So her face is very much in the light. He's hidden in shadow. So maybe we can read a little bit into that. So so for you, there's there's something going on there as well. Yeah. Um, and, and Carrie, did you have your hand up? Yes, I did, actually. Um, I, I kind of agree with the gentleman um, said earlier, uh -huh. trying to read too much into this. However, because the lighting is focused on her rather than him, and just because of her hand gesture, what I'm getting from it is that she's talking him into something and she's trying to convince him of whatever it is she has on her mind. They're having a conversation and that's why she's gesturing that way. Okay, so for you, it's a gesture of trying to convince. So she's trying to persuade him about something. All right, uh, Ingrid, you've got your hand up. Um, notice that each of them is wearing a shell on their clothing. He has a shell on his shoulder, a scallop shell, and she has, uh, I, don't, I don't know what kind of shell that is. I'm not a shell expert, but in any event, um, shells back in this time in the art world were symbols of pilgrimage. And so the fact that they're both wearing shells um, I think they're on a pilgrimage walking together and just perhaps talking about maybe their final destination or things they're seeing along the way. Okay, so introducing a new element that we haven't talked about yet is the symbolism of these shells, um, which, as you mentioned, uh, indicate being on a pilgrimage or a journey of some sort. Uh, so my, my question for the group is, is this a metaphorical journey? They're on just a journey of lovers and, you know, the blossoming of their relationship, or are they actually going somewhere? Is there some sort of narrative, do you think, that they are, they are making some sort of physical pilgrimage, um, just in, in, in your opinion? And then I'll share a little bit about the, the background of the painting in just a moment. But I want to hear Is that you... a gun in his hand over his shoulder? I think it's a walking stick, isn't it? A staff? Yes. Yeah, so it's probably, it's very hard to make out again because he's mostly in shadow, but it's probably some sort of staff or walking stick, as, as you said, John. Yeah, and you but that would get real dramatic if it was a gun. I mean, that would be a whole other element to our narrative here. And you can see the end of it above his head, too. Mm -hmm. Correct. Mm -hmm. yeah. So and that's, that's also another symbol of pilgrimage. Correct. Mm -hmm. So the title of this work is, in fact, and I think an ingredient about it, <laughs> Lover's Pilgrimage um, from the, the early or mid 1700s. Um, and it's, it's a French painting um, and it's very much of this time. So think of sort of, you know, the 50 years before the French Revolution when 
the French were living the high life if you were, you know, an aristocrat and sort of living in these fantasy worlds. They had um, what were called fat galants, where you would just, um, you know, have these these parties and these fantasies. Um, and, and this is meant to probably evoke this uh, very famous painting that was painted around this time um, about a pilgrimage to Cythera. And Cythera was the mythical home of Venus, who, as we mentioned, is the goddess of love. Um, so these lovers would, you know, journey to, to the island of Cythera. Um, and, and again, this sort of this metaphorical way, um, it, you know, they wouldn't actually go there. But this, I think, is meant to evoke this, this lover's journey where they're going to go um, and, and sort of worship at the temple of Venus, the you know, ancient goddess of love. Um, so, you know, the journey is sort of a metaphor for the, the mounting emotions and physical desires that come from a, a lover's relationship. But as we mentioned, you know, I'm a little skeptical as well because of the light and shadow. He seems to be a lot older than her, too. She seems sort of young and innocent and naive. And I do have some concerns about this here. I, I, I agree that maybe he's sort of removing her hand and she's kind of pleading for more. So I don't know. I think it, I think it, it, it's maybe a, a psychological, you know, read into everyone's mind about how they're going to react to this image and, and what you see in it. Um, but I wanted to, you know, the, the title is Lover's Pilgrimage, right? But if you were going to give this painting a new title based on your interpretation of it, what title would you give it? What would you call this painting? And you can put it in the chat or you can just share it. If we had to rename this to sort of better fit your interpretation. I would say that this is someone returning from his pilgrimage wearing the seashell from the Santiago de Compostela mm -hmm. route that he would have taken and then return home after some time. So maybe that. Okay, so the, the return home or something like that. I, I Yeah, that's a whole other side of the narrative I hadn't even considered that he is returning and she's welcoming with him with open arms. Um, Faith is saying bargaining for love and love is in quotes there, Faith. So you're a healthy skeptic <laughs> about this whole situation. Um, but that, the, thinking about that sort of transactional nature that some people have picked up on. What else, what other title could we, could, what other title could we give this painting? May, December. <laughs> May, December, okay, May, December romance could be. Uh, Karen is calling it encounter. I like that because that's, you know, that's simple but dramatic leaves some some up to the imagination yeah, it also leaves it very ambiguous too yes yeah tapping into that ambiguity there that we've been kind of so oh, maybe ambiguous encounter ambiguous encounter all right up the ante there <laughs> <laughs> any other any other suggestions for this for this dramatic painting here maybe she's asking for money to get more clothing <laughs> <laughs> cover up a little bit yeah maybe yeah, really. a little bit of spending money. All right, and I should mention too, this painting is also on view currently in gallery 15, so you can go see it in person and uh, you know, suss out this, the story between these two. Um, okay, I want to now uh, transition to uh, a painting where it seems like love has not treated the subject particularly well. <laughs> um, so again, just take a, take a moment to, to look at this painting, notice the details, and then Tell me one word you would use to describe the mood of this painting. Jilted. <laughs> jilted, oh yes, jilted. And what did you see that made you say jilted? She looks like she just had a night with somebody and he walked away. <laughs> okay, so maybe she's had sort of a romantic or, well, a. a a sensual night with someone. I don't know how much romance was involved. And then he walked away and she's sort of left here um, on her own. So Dilton, what's, an, what's another word you would use to describe the mood of this piece? Melancholy. Melancholy, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And Ingrid, what do you see that makes you say melancholy? Well, her face uh, pretty much says it all. She looks so sad, even her eyes are um, cast downward. You know, there, there's no upward wilt to the eyes. They just seem to um, look down. Oh, there's almost um, a dead quality in the eyes, like it's all the life has been removed from her eyes. And then her mouth, of course, uh, looks very sad. And you see the way she's holding her hand against her cheek. It's um, 
really a, a sign of, I think, uh, severe sorrow. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So for you, it's it's the eyes, the sort of downward drooping, her her gesture, everything is just sort of um, droopy and melancholy. Um, Josh, what about you? I definitely agree with Ingrid. Uh, there's melancholy and sadness. It's all in her in her face. The other thing that I noticed that supports that is that the, there are two doves in the painting. Mm -hmm. And the doves are being separated by her left arm. So that separation, I think, is a reflection of the separation that she's feeling. Yes, absolutely. And again, I'll zoom in on those um, doves to give you a little bit of a close up there. Um, yeah, so there's this kind of physical, her arm has come down between the two doves. Um, and not only that, not only are they physically separated, but when you look at them, they seem quite grouchy. They're sort of, you know, this one's sort of squawking at the other. The other looks like he's, you know, not happy to be squashed by this arm. Um, and, and, and very, very significantly, this artist um, used doves often um, or, or birds in general to sort of indicate the status of, of the woman that they were associated with. So often he would show girls clutching birds, you know, as a symbol of yearning or a girl might be crying over a dead bird that would symbolize a lost lover. Or sometimes you'd see birds kind of pecking at each other almost starting the mating process to symbolize courtship. Uh, but here the birds are physically separated and they seem very cranky as well. Um, so there's there's some something going on here that has caused her to feel as sad as she feels, definitely. Um, Anita, did you have your hand up or was that a leftover from the previous discussion? I think that was a leftover, but I see kind of a rejection and um, the rope around her uh, mid area. Um, I don't know. I'm not sure how to interpret that. Yeah, that's an interesting uh, costume feature here. This this rope. What what do you all make of that? Uh, this choice to have this sort of tie right here. Well, the weird part to me is that it's coming from the pedestal. It's not something that she's actually wearing. It's almost as if it were staged to be able to put that put it in the painting, if you will. Um, mm -hmm. It's just very unusual in the sense that the other part of it is is up there in the pedestal with the uh, be, you know where the doves are uh, mm -hmm. so yeah, I don't know what the purpose of I have no idea what the purpose of it is other than to keep it there <laughs> yeah. so you're noticing how it sort of um seems to almost be attached to the pedestal here or at least this sort of drape that is now on the pedestal it just seems like it doesn't quite make sense Mary were you gonna add something yeah, I, I have a sense of forlornness. Basically, I'm getting it also from the color choices. Mm -hmm. um, muted, grayish, bluish. It's just something about the color that also adds to the sense that um, she's very sad. Yeah, yeah, I'm glad you brought that up because we hadn't even considered the, the color palettes, these muted pastels. and even looking at the, you know, sort of the gray cloudy sky, it just, everything seems sort of droopy and sad and forlorn, I think is a great word to use. Um, it's just sort of this muted, depressing color palette that in another context might seem kind of beautiful and, you know, serene, but here it has that, that melancholia that Ingrid brought up. I really love the frame. Isn't that a gorgeous frame? Great frame. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, and this frame actually, um, Sorry, hold on one second. Um, this frame was not original to, to the painting. Um, it was added by an art dealer in the 20s. Um, and the mm -hmm. painting itself was originally a, a rectangle. Um, and he made the choice to frame it as an oval. Um, and it's hard to kind of you know imagine away the frame and, and, and picture this as a rectangle. But my sense is that zooming in like this with the oval it almost makes us seem like we're peering at her through a peephole like we've intruded on this private moment and to me kind of heightens the sense of drama of the scene that or the at least the, the palpable sadness that we've all been picking up on laura yes i just i see her gesture with her right hand more as someone who has vowed never to wash that 
part of her body after her lover's kiss has left its mark there. Oh, okay. okay. So another sort of romantic interpretation. I'm liking this. So she's <laughs> like, you know, like she has the kiss there and she's like, I'm never going to wash it. You know, like if you ever get to like shake hands with a celebrity, you say you're never going <laughs> to wash your hand again. Um, so, so this sort of like this, this gesture of, of holding on to something and sort of memorializing something rather than just being slumped over in sadness. I think Correct. that's a really interesting take, like especially some, because it seems like she's not necessarily supporting the weight of her head on her hand. It's more of a, a gentle touch. And we have a question from Nancy. What is the significance of the floral crown in her left hand? What do you all think this is all about here? Maybe they are coming from a party. Coming from a party, so it's part of her party costume. Other other ideas? Maybe she's been deflowered. <laughs> okay, you're going there, Mary. I see. You. Okay. Um, so maybe maybe the flowers sort of relate to deflowering and the status of her virginity. It could be. Um, and it's it's hard to tell, but um, I'm not sure if the circle is is broken or unbroken. It it may be a complete circle, or maybe there's a little bit of a gap here. Um, my guess is probably one, it's meant to sort of just place it in this sort of allusion to the classical past where she's draped in this sort of toga against a column with this sort of floral crown, um, which in one way would probably make it more acceptable that she's bare breasted, right? This is just some sort of, you know, some sort of visual metaphor for melancholy. Um, but it, it could also be this idea that, you know, the circle of flowers has to do with, with virginity or with a, a, a relationship. Um, and so there could be some, some meaning there as well to tease out. Um, I forgot to show you the title, Melancholy Young Lover. So you once again, nailed it right on the head here. Um, and it's by another French painter. This is actually on view in the same gallery as the painting we just looked at. Um, but I'm curious, and my final question to you is, is, who do you think would have purchased something like this? Like, who would this appeal to? Um, and okay, Josh, you've got your hand up. What do you think? I I think uh, it would be a wealthy gentleman who would want to display a, a nude in a, a social, socially acceptable way. Socially acceptable because of the, the, the elements of antiquity that you see in the painting. Mm -hmm. so, so sort of a, a nude image in the guise of antiquity and that, that therefore is socially acceptable. So a, a, a man very taken with this beautiful young woman could definitely be one theory. And actually um, there is a sketch for this painting that the artist made. It's in the collection of, of RISD actually, um, where the girl is entirely nude or the young woman is entirely nude. Um, so that's sort of a reminder too that the conceit of the painting is primarily erotic. Um, and so for the final painting, he put some clothes on her, um, but that, that's a great point. Any, any other thoughts about who might display something like this? And I don't know if you noticed the dimensions, but it's quite large. It's about life size. Um, when I talked about this with a, a group recently, they, just, they said it was uh, another woman who had experienced heartbreak and just wanted that sort of empathetic connection. Um, and it would have felt sort of, you know, validated by having a painting like this. Which I, I, I like that theory as well. Yeah, I was going to say a woman's boudoir in the sense mm -hmm. that it has a very feminine quality to it, as well as the frame, sort of delicate and and um, someplace that you would put in a less public area. Yes, yeah, I agree. Definitely. Maybe a boudoir. It seems like a great boudoir painting. <laughs> and maybe this young woman was uh, someone's mistress and the uh, person whose mistress she was wanted that remembrance of her perhaps after uh, an unhappy moment. Okay, yeah. So maybe there's a, even a more personal connection to the, the sitter or something like that, capturing a really personal relationship. So this is sort of a downer for a tour about love and Valentine's Day. Uh, so I'm gonna take us to our next work, which is a lot more stylized and a little more modern, um, something oh. very different. Uh, so just, right off the bat of what is going on here. Hmm. What do you, can you make out any sort of, what do you, what, what do you see in terms of, of shape or color in this, in this work? 
I see two figures, but. Okay. Yeah, it looks like they're facing each other. The uh, figure that's primarily red has, and I'm going to say her, uh, back to us, and the other uh, is facing us. They both have their right arms up. <clears throat> Okay, so we're we're distinguishing two figures here, um, and this is your your Ingrid. You're saying this is a female figure, um, and we're looking at the back of her, and she seems to be facing this other figure, and they both have their arms up. So there's this sort of um, visual <laughs> echo in their postures. Does everyone agree that there are two figures here? Does anyone see Does anyone see anything else in it? Third person. Yeah. I think that there's actually a third figure in the sense that there's an indication that these two figures have joined with each other and created a, a, another wholeness, if you will. Oh, okay. That's, that is a very profound interpretation. And can, can you say more about that? What do you mean by the, the, can you say more about that? I love this. <laughs> well, you have, uh, you know, the one figure that's mostly red, uh -huh. One figure mostly um, gray, and then you have a sort of shadow of them uh -huh. together in the blackness there. And then on the left side, as you're looking at the painting, uh, you seem to see some organization of the gray and the black entwined for this person. And then you see. Uh, the you know the you see the black on on both of them, which mm -hmm. as I'm saying is the combination of the two becoming one in the sense of as if it were a marriage or a a mm -hmm. relationship that has more than the individuals involved. Um, so while I agree that there are only two figures there, I think there's another. Uh, what do I want to say? Image of a figure that represents their relationship. Okay, thank you so much for that that explanation. That was fantastic. So yeah, and I think really picking up, you're really picking up on sort of the use of color and line. And I, I like how you're drawing our attention to the fact that this is you know the primarily red figure, the primarily gray figure, but there are echoes of gray and red in, in both. And then you have this sense that there's sort of a palpable third presence that could be just sort of an indication of their relationship, what they've made by coming together um, that, that you feel is, is part of this scene as well. Any other um, initial kind of thoughts or interpretations of what you see going on here? I do. Yeah, go for it. I don't get to use this word very often. It's one of my favorite, but I love the left arm akimbo that, <laughs> that the male figure seems to be posed in there. And and when you say male figure, are you referring to this one here? The gray, the gray figure I see is, is the, the masculine male. figure of the two. Okay. It yeah, looks so, like he's patiently listening to a lecture about what he's done wrong. Oh my god. <laughs> okay, so you're 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 introducing some sort of narrative here where this figure as seems like you're reading his his body language um as he's patiently listening to having been lectured by having done something wrong. Interesting. Correct. Okay. I see his his right arm is raised up to his head, mm -hmm. not entwined with hers. Ah, okay, yeah. So there's there's perhaps depending on how we're reading this, there's no um, sort of physical contact between the two. Maybe a, a closeness, a proximity, um, but maybe no actual touching, which perhaps is introducing that element of, of conflict or or lecture. Um, Josh, you've got your hand up. I see some connection between the two figures in the repetition of the red. The mm -hmm. figure on the left, which I is definitely female, I think, is mostly red. The figure on the right is only red on top, and I think that's hair. And that looks to me like a, like the hair of a woman. So I think I see two women here, and they're somehow connected because of the repetition of the red. Mm -hmm. Okay, so for you, you're reading both figures as female, um, and and again drawing our attention to this color as, as a sort of a connecting factor between the two, whether they have um, some sort of substantial relationship or not. But there's something that draws them together. Um, and Nita, you've got your hand up. 
I'm looking at the the red figure, the female feminine figure, and I'm I'm not sure she's she's facing out or facing towards him. Part of me, the way her arm, her right shoulder, well, it would be her left shoulder is right here. It almost appears like they're facing one another. Okay, with their, so arms, with, with their arms raised mm -hmm. towards one another. Like maybe they're going to embrace or something. Okay, so so you're reading it as though they're facing one another, but it, I think yeah. that's a good point. It's hard to tell actually which direction both are facing in. Um, but if if we buy into this idea that they're facing one another, you you're proposing perhaps they're about to embrace or come closer and, and make that physical contact or connection. Uh, Ingrid, you've got your hand up. You know, as I look at the figure that was previously identified as male, I. Um, like Josh saw them both as female, just looking at the uh, silhouette of the bodies, the body, mm -hmm. the body style looks more feminine than masculine to me of both of them. And um, on the figure in the forefront, I think you can see that it, that figure is facing the other by that sort of um, protrusion in the red that looks like Hair, you're looking at the back of someone's hair, but to the right, you see that roundish shape to the right side of the female um, whose back is to us, which I think represents the side of the face looking, looking at the other figure. And perhaps what, um, what they're talking about has surprised the other figure, which might be the reason why the hand is on the head like, oh my gosh. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. And, and I, I hate to break it to you all, but there is no real interpretation of the relationship between these two, which is sort of the magic of these more modernist, um, you know, stylized works is there's no right or wrong. And it's what everyone kind of wants to read into it. Um, I will share the name of the artist here and the title is Nude. Uh, so it doesn't say necessarily if they were female or, or male, but uh, uh, this is a, an artist, Saito Kyoshi. Um, and we are opening an exhibition, a big, a big exhibition of his works um, on March 14th. So soon you will be able to see a lot of his, his work. And this is just one example. Um, but he was very interested in and inspired by these modernist aesthetics. So these big blocks of color, um, you know, blocky kind of designs and, and geometrics. Um, and he never really made it all the way to abstraction. There was always some sort of semblance of of a figure or of narrative, which I think is what we were kind of uh, picking apart today and trying to kind of explore what was going on here. Um, but he's a really, a really fascinating artist. And again, you'll be able to see a lot more of his work soon. Um, and also our, our curator of Asian art, Dr. Rhiannon Paget, has written a catalog to go with the exhibition. And this is one of the works that's featured in that. Um, so if this is the kind of thing that intrigues you, if you like to puzzle over these mysteries of these, um, these shadowy figures and, and bright colors, you can spend some more time in that exhibition very soon. Um, in the interest of time, I'm gonna to move to our final work for today. We're gonna to get even more contemporary. We're gonna come right into present day. Um, and this is our, our last work for today. Um, so I wanted to just, again, get your initial impressions of this work of art um, and just ask you, what is, what is going on in this image? I think more intimacy. That's it. Yeah, that's a, intimacy is a great word to describe for me. I, I agree. Um, and and so let's let's puzzle that out. How is intimacy represented in this photo? With the embrace of the two couples and the fact that uh, the two people rather, and that they're uh, seated on a bed that looks like it was just recently thrown together. Okay, so you're noticing where they're sitting a bed, right, which connotes intimacy for many people. Um, and even the fact that the, the bedspread seems a little bit um, haphazardly placed. Um, and then the embrace too, they're like so, so closely entwined. So there's intimacy in, in the posture, where they are seated. Um, is there intimacy in, in other ways in this photo? What other ways is, is sort of intimacy represented or suggested? It's it seems to be the cigarette pretty well. What was that? I missed the first part of that. Something about the cigarette? 
as it, she she seems to it would seem to be intimate if she's tolerating his cigarette smoking that, <laughs> that way. Okay, so she doesn't seem to be bothered by the fact that he's smoking. So there's a, a perhaps a relationship there where she's yeah. like she's fine with that. Um, Mary, were you going to add something? I was just going to say his eyes are closed and that can give you a sense that he's really into her. Yeah, yeah. And let me zoom. You know, I love to zoom in. Um, he's got his eyes closed. And then let's talk about wh wh where she's looking. What do you make of, of her gaze here? Maybe she's looking at us as if we just interrupted their moment. Yeah, Ingrid, I get the same sense that she's she's looking right out at us as we've intruded again, kind of creating this the sense of intimacy that then we have so have punctured. I agree, Laura. And the expression is, "Would you close the door, please?" <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. We've we've stepped into the space where we are not a part of of what is going on, and there's sort of a yeah, there's sort of a distance that's being um, suggested to us. And uh, can you close the door? Leave us to it. Um, absolutely. Um, what is in the mirror and the poster? I can't see them well enough. So the poster is Michael Jackson. You're right. um, oh. And the mirror, it's a little bit hard to make out. I mean, you can see the, the shape of the, oh. the people. And then I, I think it's a couple of black and white photographs, maybe some sort of abstract print. It looks like a drawing of a bicycle and then some, some lists or handwritten pieces of paper. But I think you're right to point out that detail that it's, it, again, gives you the sense of this is this room is a lived space with someone who has been, you know, you know, decorating it and putting lists on the wall. Um, and interestingly, this is actually the artist's own bedroom. This is the artist, um, Deanna Lawson. Um, and she normally shoots her subjects um, in their own homes or wherever they feel comfortable. Uh, but this this woman here, Binky, didn't want her to shoot in her own home. So Deanna Lawson offered her own bedroom. So I think there's this other layer of intimacy where we are now in the artist's personal space. Um, so I think you know, there's all kinds of layers of, of, of stepping into someone's sort of inner circle here. Um, so, oh, oh, sorry, go ahead. I was just gonna say, there used to be an expression called bedroom eyes. And yes. when you look at Binky's eyes, you know, half closed, I mean, there's just a real sultry um, expression there. Yeah, a bedroom eyes, and that's a, a perfect, a perfect way to describe that. And I think you're absolutely right, Ingrid. Um, Lawson, the artist, has talked a lot about how um, a lot of her work is she's she's creating what she doesn't see in popular media culture, um, and she really wanted to make an image that was about embracing and intimacy and support and the sort of physical young love between between two young people, and in this case, two young black people, because she's, you know, there's not a lot of, of representation in the mainstream media currently. Um, so absolutely, she wanted to do something that felt powerful, that felt private and, and intimate, and I think she's really captured it there. Um, how would you describe the dynamic since we've been, um, you know, psychoanalyzing all of our subjects? What is the dynamic <laughs> between these two? Um, what is their relationship like, and what clues do we have to that? We've mentioned that his eyes are closed. She's kind of more aware and is looking at us, but are there other clues as to sort of their relationship? Well, her body is completely leaned up against his. It's just so uh, comfortable, so normal, so together, um, two becoming one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good point. If you look, um, you know, from the very, from their feet all the way up, they're just like pressing, against one another they're so they're so close any other thoughts on i'll share a little bit about the artist and this is oh sorry go ahead mary no the only other thing that struck me about the scene itself was how feminine the room looked I, it was interesting when you said who the uh whose bedroom it is and i looked at the lace or fringe around the spread, the type of furniture, the flowers, the soft drapes. I just saw a lot of femininity. Yeah, Mary, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because I was going to I was going to mention the beauty of having these contemporary artists is that they talk about their work and we can know exactly kind of what they were thinking. Um, and, and the artist has said she wanted this to feel like a female space and about 
you know, the, the female's gaze and the female's love being sort of the driving factor um, that, that made this composition work. Um, and she's, she has said too, you know, the, the, the man is not in an inferior position per se, but he's seated and she's standing and she's sort of leaning on him and it feels like her space. So it's about kind of power um, and, and empowering the woman, Binky. Um, so I'm glad you brought brought that out, Mary. That it is this very kind of female space where in which she is sort of dominant. Um, oh, the finger polish on the nightstand there mm -hmm. lends support to that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Although those appear to be his shoes under the little dresser drawers there. Yeah, those do look like big big shoes down there. Yeah, and he's got his socks on, so so could be. Um, I wanted to just just note too that uh, Lawson is very careful in composing her photos. She's really thinking about the elements of art, so texture and line and color. Um, and she uses models that she kind of encounters in her daily life on the subway, in the grocery store. Um, and, and these two, they, this is not a real couple. This is something that she has composed to convey that sense of young love. Um, and I think done a very good job in, in doing that. It feels very believable, but every element of this this photograph is very deliberately constructed. Um, so I'm curious, does that does it feel deliberate to you or does it feel like this sort of snapshot that she happened upon? It feels very natural to me. Mm -hmm. I'm noticing the apartment, you know, the parquet floors, and there's almost a sense of emptiness to it, you know, with just that one little poster on the wall. There's no uh, lampshade over the light bulb. Mm -hmm. um, it reminds me very much of New York apartments, New York City apartments, that is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Feels very, very real um, and, exactly. and, and natural, even though we know it's, it's composed. Yeah, that's a, a great point. All right, um, we're we're just at eleven thirty now, so I'll just wrap up quickly here. Um, I wanted to mention that the title, as I as I showed you, was Binky and Tony Forever. Um, and originally, the artist has said she was thinking about calling this Young Love, uh, but she changed it to Binky and Tony Forever. And I'm wondering what that title connotes for you, um, and why you think she might have made that change. I don't think of forever as meaning forever. Okay, so forever maybe something aspirational that is not yes. really going to be realized. Um, it reminds and, me of the kind of thing that somebody might write on uh, the cover of their loose leaf notebook if they were a teenager. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, it feels very like that young teenage love, right? I, yeah, I exactly. Uh, Josh, you've got your hand up. Yes, I, I think the title is ironic because I just, it really doesn't look to me like these, these are two people who are going to be together forever. I, mean, oh. I, I take, I take the, the title as ironic. I'm so agreeing that it's sort of like that, that teenage thing you say, we're going to be together forever, and then it doesn't, doesn't always last. And Anita, did you want to weigh in as well? Well, maybe forever is today. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Forever is today. There's sort of an immediacy and a presence to where we are in this moment and just sort of living in it fully, um, come what may the next day. Um, okay, I do have one last thing for you to do. We're going to play matchmaker ourselves. I have called uh, portraits from the Ringling Collection here. Um, oh and <laughs> because how can we talk about Valentine's Day without being cupids? So, um, if this was match.com and you were you were looking through the ringling uh, the ringling crew here, uh, who of these folks do you think would be the biggest flirt? The young lady down at the bottom in red. This one or this one? Yes, the one to the right. Yeah. The topless one. <laughs> And it looks like she's got some major advertising going on there, too. <laughs> so she seems like she would probably be the biggest part. OK, we'll go with that. Who of these would be the most hopeless romantic? <laughs> oh, I would. Oh, go, go ahead, Anita. Oh, um, I would say the fellow on the 
top second second to the left. I guess this the this guy here. Yes. And why why did you pick him for the hopeless romantic? He sort of looks pained. <laughs> yes, he's a little angsty, right? Like looking. I think you're like, oh dear. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Totally. Who do you think of these would be, uh, who would be the most likely to take you to a five-star restaurant for your first date? Uh, totally the guy just to his right. This he guy here? Like, yeah, he looks like a player for sure. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so that's okay. So we've kind of we've, we've, we've played the field a little bit. And then I've got one more. So now we're going to be the matchmakers. Um, if you had to pair two of these people together, and we don't have to subscribe to heteronormity, we can pair women with women or men with men or men with women. Of these of these folks here, who is the best matched if, if we're going to be our little cupids? Well, bottom left and second top right. <laughs> These two here. They belong together. They can, they, can talk about, they can talk about lace together on their first date. <laughs> <laughs> sure, didn't Not sure they're a happy couple, but they're definitely together. <laughs> okay, so for you, it's these two. Any other any other pairings here? Who could we match? I will about the two um, on the bottom to the right of uh, Mr. Fancy Pants. These two? Yes. And why do they go together? Well, they seem to be about the same age and they both look very serious. They do. They have kind of the same expression on. That's a good, good point. Uh, Josh, what about you? What, what match are you making here? The, the woman on the upper right and the uh -huh. man immediately to the left of her because they are both into the arts. He, he's into mm -hmm. literature. She's into music. But they're perfect. They'll have just, yeah, very cultured little babies. <laughs> um, and finally, Anita, and and us, and us, bring us home today. Who are you going to match up? Well, I would say this is the man, the second from uh, to the right on the top, uh -huh. and the woman in the center on the bottom, because they both look very intense to me. You know, yes, very. yes, total intensity. And I think this one I, and this one. Yeah, I think I think we've made some good love matches here. So, you know, if Night at the Museum comes true and these people all pop out of their frames at night, hopefully they will uh, take our suggestions. <laughs>